Thank you so very much. Grace to you in the name of God our Father. In Jesus' name, who is the very Christ of God. It is an honor to be here and to serve the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Your tomorrow has been sanctified. Joshua chapter 1, the Bible says, wash yourself against tomorrow. Because tomorrow he will do wonders in the midst of you. You may be going through hell right now, but the good news is you still have a tomorrow. Amen. Grace to all of you. I'm going to preach God's word. It is an honor to be here. First of all, thank you all for your support on Pentecost Sunday. It was a beautiful display of God's power, his faithfulness, his love, and his loyalty. Aren't you glad that in a world where people are disloyal, the Lord in his faithfulness continues to do envy everything he does and is. Throw them hands up and say, keep being you, keep being you. That's all I need. I just want you to keep doing what you're doing. So we are excited about that. Listen, we have a lot of stuff going on. Who in the world was going to inform me that we are six months away from 2023? I don't know that anybody was fair enough to inform me that this year is almost over. <laughs> and we still trying to catch our breath from the last 48 months. Now we about to be in 2023. Psychologically, I tried to test myself and my readiness. I tried to write the year 2023 and it wouldn't even come out my pen. It was really weird. You know, I remember writing 1997, 19, you know, it was even weird when we had to start writing 2000. We thought Y2K was coming. I was singing how I got over, praying in tongues, repenting for everything I'd ever thought about because we were told that the banks were going to crash and all of that. But we're still here. Uh, the point is there is a tomorrow. His mercy is everlasting. It endureth to every generation. Just scream with me one last time and say tomorrow. That's why I'm encouraged. Hallelujah. It's about tomorrow for me. Glory. Ain't got nothing to do with today. It's all about tomorrow. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Okay, so we're in a series called Why Church. Next Sunday is Father's Day, and I know y'all shysty. You know, y'all pack out the churches with your roses and your hats for Mother's Day. Father's Day, y'all be in Bermuda and Vegas and, you know. Will y'all not uh, act weird next week for Father's Day as we celebrate the absolute gift of masculinity? It is, it is a gift. Come on, put those hands together. It is a gift. God calls men to be women, and he designed men to be men and women to be women. Forgive me. <laughs> he separates them unto their identity and their assignment for his cause. And so we're not just celebrating those of you that have been natural fathers, but brothers and husbands. And I think we need to celebrate the uncle, not to go on a rampage, but we're in a generation that don't even have good uncles no more. I mean, my God. I, ha I can't remember the last time I talked to somebody who talked to their granddad. So we need to celebrate the species, the breed, the type and kind that is called man. And we need to honor them and make sure that God continues the manhood story. Adam means man. But I'm after the second Adam, the second man. His name is Jesus the Christ. And I'd much rather live my life like him than anybody else, all right? So we're excited about Father's Day. Don't y'all stay at home and go to brunch and be full of mimosas and telling your mama happy Father's Day. That's dysfunctional, okay. You tell I said it, that's dysfunctional. All right, we're in a series called Why Church? And uh, I'm plowing through this for the rest of this season because I really do feel like I'm not convincing and nor persuading. What I'm doing is representing a paradigm of why the church is still necessary. God's trying to pull y'all off y'all phones into the power of the local church. And um, we have to reconsider where we are, what we think, what we believe. And so I have a very unique word from the Lord today. It will bless some of you. It will convict others of you. It will heal others of you. It will offend others of you. If you're watching me on live stream, be prepared today to replay, repeat, rehearse a lot of what I say because I'm coming for your jugular. In the book of Galatians, <laughs> chapter 5. We're going to have a very interesting discussion. <laughs> Last week, I taught and asserted that you did not have to earn anything from God. 
You don't have it in you to earn it. On your best day, you steal. Your righteousness is like a filthy rag. You could get a great report card, straight A's, and do it all in your power, in your strength, and if your effort. But if you use it as a resume to show to God why you deserve whatever he's going to do for you, it converts itself into pride. Pride is your impression with what you can do without God what you can be without God, where you can go without him, in your talent, in your skill, in your potential. And so today is going to be very, very opposite because I have a, pr a principle to introduce to you that you should live your life by on forever. Now, warning, this is not PG-13, Dr. Gordon. This is going to be something you're going to have to study and debate and reason with. You will have to go through your own detox before you talk to it about your friends and your family members because it's going to be something that we saw in plain sight. We just choose to ignore for the sake of our own comfort. Galatians chapter 5 verse 11. And I'm reading this in the King James Version. When you're there, say I'm there. If you're not there, say wait on me. And I bet you them three wait on me's have androids. I'm thoroughly convinced that that green has had y'all in delay. But those of us that are of the blue kind, put those hands together for I. Oh, oh, all right. Oh, y'all, I have a preach back church this morning, Bob. Galatians chapter 5, verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all of the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, love thy neighbor, yeah, I know you would be quiet as thyself. Here's my thought. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed by one another. This I say then, walk in the spirit. I love your word. And ye shall not fulfill, or oh, we don't preach like that no more, the lust of the flesh. <laughs> For the lust, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. But these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Here we, we almost there, calm down. But if ye be led by the spirit, ye are not, I love your word, under the law. Y'all quiet, just, just tight. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, <laughs> which are these. Adultery, come on, let's, uh, we family, we're going to do it today. Fornication, uncleanness, say man now. Lasciviousness, we was just shouting a minute ago. Idolatry, here's one I can't wait to work. Witchcraft, Lord have mercy. Hatred, variance, emulations. Wrath, you yeah, quiet, strife, seditions, and heresies, envyings, and murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I told you before, as I've told you in times past, they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. My primary thought is out of verse 15, and I only have a little bit to do this, and the louder you say, man, the quicker I'll release you. Verse 15 says, but if you bite and devour... If you bite and devour, if you bite and devour, if you bite and devour one another. In the Living Bible, in the ESV, it says, be careful because pretty soon you'll eat one another alive. I'd like to talk to you very briefly about Christian cannibalism. I'll say it again. I want to talk to you about the reality that there are believers that like to eat people. Yeah. And the silence and the awkwardness in the room is because you want to take the position of Agent Starling. You're the victim. But the real truth is I'm talking to Dr. Hannibal. 
Because I know you think you were the victim. But somebody else is on your menu. In Galatians chapter 5, this letter is written by Paul the Apostle to a network of churches, as it were, stay with me, in the region of Galatia. And the reason this is significant is because Paul never had a stationary pastoral assignment. Now, that doesn't sound real deep to you, but I'm going to tell you why that means something emotionally and relationally. When a set man and or a set woman or a set anything establishes a platform in front of a people, they develop, as it were, a connection to their needs. Scream yes. An understanding of their pain. Say yes. The technical term is altruism. It's empathy. It's a chemical attachment. It, it is a biochemical attachment uh, to what you need, and, and they become providers. They're not just communicators and teachers and expositors. They become suppliers of wisdom that you need to survive. And unfortunately, many of our experiences have been that most of us have got stuck in trying to learn survival. And survival is preschool for the believer. You're not ready for that, but I'll get there later. If you're just surviving, you've not taken full advantage of everything redemption was meant to do in you. Scream, yeah. And so Paul has this challenge of net networking and migrating, and some would call it meandering, others would call it wandering, between a network of churches from different backgrounds. Now, the reason that that's important is because you're not just sitting next to somebody with nice shoes and next clothes. You're sitting next to a background. Now, that doesn't mean much to you. But the problem is when you try to relate to and love and understand people whose background you don't comprehend, what happens is you're going to misunderstand everything they say and everything they do. You're going to be committed to misunderstanding because you didn't have the love depth, watch me, to try to conceptualize their background to understand what or and interpret because love interprets you don't have time for that love takes the time and is patient enough to decode and to unlock and to be patient you can't tell me you love me and you're not patient I'll get there later because love is patient y'all don't like that love takes its time it's not in a rush that's flesh mm. but uh, in this particular area what we see now is a very complicated very sophisticated network of churches between different people who are all under the same word are you listening to me or not. They came from different cities under the same word. Different experiences under the same word. And contrary to all of the other letters of Paul, we see a huge amount of frustration. Come on and talk to me. We see passion and we see principle but we also hear a lot of frustration now. The reason it's uncomfortable right now is because people taught you that frustration was the devil. It was immature and it was the byproduct of the flesh and it was because you didn't have enough faith but here's a deal what do you do when you have faith and you're still frustrated when you worship and you're still frustrated when you pray I just got off a seven day fast but I'm still frustrated my personal piety did nothing about my life frustration and the problem is the longer you suppress I love your word your frustration then you're going to miss out on the explanation about why you do the things you do that you don't want to do you're frustrated that's the problem. You're successful and suppressed. I'll preach by myself. You're pretty and you've been oppressed. You're degreed and you're ignored. Oh yeah. You're, 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 you're powerful in your influence but you're the only one who don't recognize that you are who you are. And that produces frustration. Come on, talk to me. Frustration. Uh, but frustration is always the womb to the future. Write it down if you didn't. You have no future if you can't handle what it is to be frustrated. Frustration Frustration is the tension point between the past and the future. It's the middle place when you're in transition trying to figure out what is sufficient and what is appropriate and what can feed you and what you got to leave and what you got to attach to. Is there anybody in here that's going to stop the church facade and say, yeah, I'm frustrated. <laughs> I got some prophecies that frustrate me. Come on, talk back. I got some stuff I've been praying for and I'm growing just a bit frustrated. I love my mama. She's fine, but she frustrate me. My daddy is my best friend, but he getting on my God. Insert here nerve. Come on. Anybody frustrated in here? Now here's a problem. The reason you won't grow in your faith is because you won't be honest about your frustration. The way faith grows is by handling I'm working in here. Managing I'm working in here. Stewarding your level of frustration. But when you give your frustration over to the flesh, you're going to always end up in a place called deception. It's an oasis. 
It's an island. It's a place to land up. I know a lot of people trapped right now at La Boreana because they didn't know what to do with their frustration. There's a lot of people that are not growing because they didn't know what to do with their frustration. And they use frustration as the sign or the key to run or to rebel or to return back to vomit or to backslide. But your frustration is supposed to be an indicator of your next need of God. Good googly moogly. Your frustration is supposed to be an indicator to you that I've reached a limit now and if I stay within myself I'm going to kill myself I'd much rather throw myself on the rock than have the rock throw it on me so lead me to the one I can't get help now that is higher than I yes I'm frustrated but I'm still focused (laughs) because the presence of frustration doesn't mean the absence of focus it just means that I'm uncomfortable I'm thirsty I'm getting bored I'm claustrophobic and I've got to get out of this level, this realm, this zone. Anybody in here, I'm fresh. Mm. I got a promise. Doesn't look like it's happening. Got a word. Doesn't look like it's manifesting. I had goals and I went to dream board parties. Yeah. Just frustrated. But frustration is a sign. Watch me. Can I preach this? That you've engaged the future in a way that you don't know. Frustration is the sign, watch me, I'm getting here, that your appetite is coming out of your circumstance. Your situation, your scenario, your appetite is that, oh no, something is out there. Can I preach to you? Baby, there's more. Honey, there's more. And there's more in multiple areas of your life. There's more to who you are. It's everything you are. There is an artistic more, a creative more, a pioneering more. There is a powerful more, a historic more. There is a bold more, a three-dimensional more, a celestial more. There's a heavenly more. There's a lot more. There's just a lot more. And what the devil does is he gets people trapped in the prison of frustration because you don't want them to ever see what's out there more. Paul writes from this place. Mm, Preach, Negro. He's been out there and he's got revelation. Mm. He's learned and studied and investigated some stuff that was counter-cultural, counter-theological, and he's still writing in a polytheistic society. And that basically means that everything in that society was attached to a deity, a demon, or a god. Every religion in the world that is not that that tells a story of the slain lamb is the byproduct of an agenda of a fallen angel. Because what you'll learn by this is uh, the devil has certain technologies that he's tapped into that we abandon. And the first thing he did after he rebelled was find community. I'm getting there in a minute. He, he, he went and got a squad. That's your problem, and I'm going to get there in a minute. And so we have this issue of Galatia where Paul is writing to interpret. Come on, let's go. He's writing to clarify because when you have any congregation, when you have any assembly, uh, one of the things that you don't realize is the conversation that's established by the gathering. So we're sitting here right now and you're listening to me expodulate and uh, 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 expound on the word of God, right? You're listening to me uh, present truth and principle and parabole to you. You're listening to me give you homilies and things that make you meditate and consider your life. Uh, Understand that. But what you're really doing is silent conversing. You're trying to believe and consider what you think about this and what you believe about this and how this is applicable to you. So every congregation around the world, even when they're quiet, they're still talking. There's a narrative being born. It it creates the culture. I love your word. The Bible says in Hebrews, it's by your word the worlds were framed. So it's what people talk about that determines what they're living in. Their realities are determined by their vocal power, how verbal they are. This is why men that are born to silent men always end up depressed I'm not here to counsel you but but your verbalness your vocalness your ability to express and say let there be and there was is a God giving inheritance that God has given for every man to do I can talk my way into it I can talk my way out of it but I'm not here to preach that and so we have this principle now where Paul is trying to interpret and clarify now just for historic reason you know this letter is written in this uh, frustration of Paul because Paul lives in 
this dualism. Come on, let's go and do some investigation. He lives in contradiction. He lives in conflict. I've got a calling that my culture despises. I've got a calling that I've got to enter into a competition that I didn't sign up for. I've got a calling that other people have decided that I'm not qualified for. No, they don't know my mother. Come on, I'm working in here. They have no clue what I've lost and what I've suffered, but they've decided that they have become the executive board of the approval of my assignment. And so now, after Damascus and after Gamaliel and after Arabia, I got to go and talk to people who feel like they are the authenticators. Your word is life. The verifiers, the proof, the, 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 the managers, the referees of what God called me to do. But the problem is, I got resurrected and called by Jesus that had died and got up. Y'all had to have them in the flesh. So could it be that perhaps I'm going to work harder than you? I'm going to move forward. Because you had to get your immaturities dealt with when he was a man. I got it when he was raised as the lion. And so if we're going to compare credentials, ooh, we don't like that. If we're going to combat experience to experience, encounter to encounter, who do you think you are to qualify me? He lives in contradiction of this. And the reality of the book of Galatians is uh, the Messianic Christian movement was started in Jerusalem. Now, the way they saw it was a nationalist message. The message of the Messiah to them was supposed to be a matter of race. Open yourself up and consider. It was not a matter of the synagogue or your faith practice. It was an ethnic issue. When they prophesied the Messiah, they assumed and asserted that he belonged to the Jews for Normally the Hebrews now coming into Israel and becoming a Jew. So they, assumed, they, they, they owned him. He became their mascot. But then something started to happen after Jerusalem where the message started impacting human beings everywhere. So then naturalized Israelites was like, hey, 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 you can't be healed by what's for us. You can't be delivered by what's for us. You're not from here. You're not one of us. We don't know you. Remember that criticisms of Jesus? Why does he teach with so much authority? I love your word seeing that he ain't even came out of one of our schools we ain't verified his transcripts and it's something that folk that's less accomplished than you still want to investigate you i'll move forward they want to make sure they critique stuff that they still aspiring to how dare you with that 400 credit credit score get your life okay and so we have this issue now where the message started to impact the human race it was not just for israel at this point it was for humanity it was not just for israel at this point it was for humanity and if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ screamed the word cannibal, if we would ever conceptualize that the gospel ain't for church people, then I think we'd actually be better at being the church. Our problem is our privatizing of the gospel as if it is our exclusive trademark and insignia and embossment. And your proud tail got your hand on a gospel that don't belong to you. And yet and still the human race has never even heard a clear message message on what the gospel is screen preach because y'all still preaching that the gospel is the wages of sin is death that ain't no good news that's actually bad news i tell myself if i've got to calculate everything i did wrong from this morning till now i'm not worthy of heaven good god from zion so what then is the gospel and the real truth is the church don't know because she's preaching rumors i'm working in here she's preaching rhetoric and so she's inherited but what in the world Oh, it's the good news. So Paul had to navigate through this confusion. Imagine a hundred of people in praise break that all believe a different thing. Imagine folk holding hands and slapping their neighbors and their doctrine is in direct antithesis of each other. Just the opposite of everything it's supposed to be. Imagine that confusion in a network of churches and the frustration it must have been to be Paul and now manage this movement, this message that is spreading aloud. So by Paul's visibility now, pay attention, just track with me. I know I'm not Dr. Seuss, but I got a word for you. Paul's visibility at this point now has him in a real conundrum. And the conundrum is this. There are just as many 
primarily Jewish Christians as non-Jewish Christians. And how it got there, we don't know. The problem is, is leading up into the Messianic era, the Jewish uh, people outnumbered everybody on the world. And then when the Messiah came, there was a segment of Jews that believed on him, but then there was a segment of them that hated him. You know, the Jews killed Jesus. The Bible said he went to his own. You don't like that. And they didn't receive him. They killed him. It was his own. It was church folk. It wasn't a sinner anyway. <laughs> so, um, 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 but by, by the time he's raised now, um, there's just as many. The, 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 the scene, the setting is the same. you got numeric uh, equality in this. Now, this reality created a real debate. This is background. I'm going to make you shout in a minute. It created a debate, a debate in Acts 15. Here's why. Uh, historically, because the chosen people of God were an ethnic group. Here's what happened. Paul! After he got called by God, he felt the need to go to the other apostles. This is one regime having a conversation with the next. This is one mentality having to have a new one reconsider and reevaluate. There was a debate and a discussion that was held in humility and honor. And he went to the 12 and James mitigated this. My God. And what happened was, was Peter and the rest of the apostles agreed. Scream yes. And they agreed because Paul's position was, hey. Hey, if I'm going to keep preaching circumcision as if that is the way I'm getting to my point as if that is the way the pattern the route to salvation then what's going to happen is I've got to revive and resuscitate the law of Moses listen to me and I've got to make are you listening now I've got to make the law of Moses superior to the gospel of Jesus and that's the problem with a lot of church people today we cannot differentiate the message of Moses and the message of Jesus and y'all love y'all some Moses but how you feel about the fact that you're going to meet him in heaven he didn't die for you he didn't give his blood up for you he was not the lamb he was a prophet and what he was was a forerunner to the messiah's message in the earth but y'all know more about moses than you do know about the messiah you know more about the ten commandments than the gospel of the kingdom you fight casting out devils but will preach that decalogue as if it gets you salvation but jesus said you read the scriptures because you think in them you find eternal life but they are they that speak of me how you ain't gonna know him and preach Moses anyway so um, you have this issue. He goes to the apostles. Are you with me? He goes to the apostles and they reach a, a settling. They come to a conclusion. And here go Peter, like many of you church people say, cannibal. Peter goes and Peter is, is chilling, you know. He's adaptive. He's flexible. Many of you would call him a chameleon. Stay with me. And because when he's with the, 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 the non-Jewish Christians, these are people that were not naturalized. Are you staying with me? These are people that were not natural is, uh, uh, Israeli or Hebrews or none of that dissent. These were the Gentile Christians, right? When Peter was with them, he was turning up. He was mingling. They was going to Red Lobster, and they, they was chilling, and he didn't have questions about that. But then, when the opposition came from the Jews, they showed up, and they started questioning Peter about why he was sitting with them, mm -hmm. why he was walking with them, and why he was at the table with them, and why he was drinking wine with them, and why he was on the dance floor with them. All of this comes up. And, and, and Paul said, you know what, Peter? You so fake. I wish I, you so phony. Where the heck, where heck is all that boldness now? You was walking on waters. Now you're going to be a wuss because church people are challenging you about the fact that you went to your brother's graduation. Church people are beating you up because your little brother is having a party because he just got out of jail and you dancing with him. And they're telling you that you like the world. Come on, let's not be stupid now. Paul walked up to Peter and said, I appreciate your keys your kingdom, your authority, but you're fake. You're a fraud. Just the other day, come on, let's go here. You were out there, and you were doing a cha-cha slide. You was doing a booty hanger. You was doing everything you want to do, but now here these Negroes come in a collar and a robe, and here they come, and you want to change up and switch up. Let me tell you something, baby. Be everything you is in front of me. Don't you put on no church costume because that's not the one that need the healing. I don't need the church you to get delivered. I need the real you to get delivered so don't change in front of you be the devil that you are you be as broken as you are you be as weak and as honest if you are because if you're not honest you're not getting healed I would... Peter you're going to put on your robe now 
And you was just at the bar last night. And the gospel was the gospel at the bar. Did it become a super gospel when it hit the church? <laughs> so Paul confronts him. He calls him a hypocrite. He says, you fake. You anointed and fake. God, I got 20. <laughs> you speak in tongues and phony. Mm. You, 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 you hug people that you talk about. And you sis and bro people that you really want to sleep with. Let's go to church now. You had praise breaks for people you're pounding. I wish I had help now. Come on, New York City, let's go to church. I'm here to bust the devil open to the white meat. And when the grease is hot enough, the chicken will fight. And the devil is a chicken. I'm here right now to bind the powers of hell in the house. Shout hallelujah. Fake. Fake. This ain't no praise break. It's flirting. Fake. You don't want my number for counseling. You get lonely at night. Fake. Fake, fake, fake. Galatians addresses the phony. I wonder what the church would be like, Pastor Darrell, if we could hear a whole message on phony. Amen. Now. A part of this debate was threefold, scream, preach. And one of them was the circumcision of men. So a part of this debate in Acts 15 was about whether or not you could be saved if you were not circumcised. Because here's what all humans do. We weaponize histories against history. Journeys against journeys. Experience against experience. My reality is normal. Your experience is abnormal that elevates me and gives me a superior standing against you. My pain is more profound. All you had to deal with was this and that. And when we get into that non-altruistic form of Christianity, which means that we only feel what we feel, the gospel has a limit. And then you get up in church, somebody reaches to the highest valley. <laughs> Do you believe that? Because there's some people on the top of the mountain that need the blood. And then you say he reaches to the lowest valley, but if they smell like last night, you talk about it. I'm walking in here. You want to bind the broken. Right. So the circumcision of men. Th their position against Peter was, how do you eat with men that are uncircumcised? I love you, Jesus. How do you sit down and get, I mean, they were so religious. They were mad at Peter for who he ate with. It was almost like they were so stupid. They thought that who you ate with control your salvation. Now, you laughing at that, but think about the stupidity you've been taught. Does your who you eat with determine where you're spending eternity? How dumb is that? But because you've not devoted yourself to dying, Doctrine. What you do is you believe whatever authoritative narcissistic voice that has a mic in his hand that embosses this foolishness in you and gives you a continuing conversation called condemnation where you can't even eat with your unsaved family without feeling like they're contagious. Why are you eating with them? My hot dog ain't got nothing to do with what happened to your genitals. My steak is medium rare. I don't care who put a scalpel on your stuff. That ain't none of my lift your hands and scream business. But people bound by the religious spirit. They carry a stethoscope, a measuring rod, a curriculum for who you are and who you are not. So you got this, and then you got eating kosher. Okay, I'm almost done. Then you got those that observe the Sabbath. And so the Jewish Christians felt like the non-Jewish Christians should have to get in the same way. They felt like um, if I had to labor for this, if I had to obey the Torah, if I had to have Moses is ex experiencing me, how do you get to get in by something as simple as faith? Mm. What you mean, grace? 
you, 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 you got to toil and earn and work and qualify and be a part of the census in the book of Numbers. We got to know your mama, your daddy. And then we got to make sure that if you've been around a woman on her menstrual cycle, that you've not been around her for at least 60 days. That's Old Testament law. And if you broke one, this is your Bible, you broke them all. We maintain our preservation of certain laws, but we escape the others. Am I teaching to anybody in here? Now, in chapters 1 and 2 of Galatians, this is my sermon, it's five minutes. Paul is challenging their understanding of the gospel. Is the gospel what you hear during the sermon? Or is the gospel a way of life? Can I preach the gospel if I don't live the gospel? Help me preach. Can I proclaim it if I don't live it? So then what does living the gospel look like? Mm. If we're challenged now in the word to, to be doers and not hearers only, I wonder if the absence of healing is because everybody wants to hear and not do. But the gospel is something to be done. That's why Jesus said it is finished. <laughs> he had to do it. He had to do the gospel. He had to do the gospel. And in Galatians, Paul's challenge is this, their understanding of the gospel. Verse 3 and 4, I mean, chapters 3 and 4, forgive me, he argues that the real gospel magnetizes nastiness. This is chapters 3 and 4. You're quiet already. He argues that, that when the real gospel is preached, you've got all kind of infestation. Sickness, disease, brokenness, woundedness, it all comes in. People bring their background. God, I love you today. They bring their background. They may never articulate it, precious Jesus, but they bring it. You run into it. Now, if you want to test out what's going on, I'm getting to my real message. Try to love. Because a human... The human's ability and capability and capacity to love is limited, which is why you need the Holy Ghost to do it for real. You don't have it in you to love unconditionally. Everybody's got a price. You'll leave unless you got the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost keeps marriages together. The Holy Ghost keeps friendships together. Everybody's fickle. <laughs> But the Holy Ghost is the keeper of the covenant of God. He, he upholds and stewards God's promises. He protects and hovers over the words and the definitions and the covenants we make one to another. And so we need that. So we have this issue here with Galatians where Paul is interpreting amongst this confusion in this conversation. He has this issue with Paul. He confronts, I'm sorry, Paul has this issue with Peter. This uh, Jerusalem council shows up. He challenges him on his hypocrisy. And now Paul maintains something that nobody had ever maintained about Jesus Christ and his missive or his message. He maintained this. That you could not be righteous by what you did right. It's really quiet, and I know I'm hitting you in a nerve. But your rightness is not righteousness. Mm. Your rightness, getting it right, getting it perfect, that's not righteousness. Righteousness is something you receive. It's not something you achieve. You don't achieve righteousness. You receive it. If you got the Holy Ghost, obey me. Throw them hands up and scream, by faith. Come on, just open your mouth. Say, by faith. Because you don't have it in you to be good enough, to be worth it enough, to be kind enough. That's in the flesh. And so Paul maintained that there was a way by faith and that the works and the rules of the Torah wasn't enough to restore. It wasn't enough to restore. The blood of bulls and heifers, I'm getting there, and goats, it wasn't enough to restore. They were doing that to maintain and to handle the sin deficit and the sin cost and the sin penalty and the sin price. They were doing that for generations and it still didn't work. They were still offering up blood and, and pigeons and stuff, but then Israel for seasons and generations will end up in cycles of sin, cycles of sin, which means that you can give offerings and say you're sorry and shout and dance and still be in a cycle. Preach, Negro. It means that your dancing don't get you out of the cycle and your tithe don't get you out of the cycle. It don't get you out of the cycle. You are living in a life of cycles. It's called iniquity. It's repeat pattern. It's, it's the same bondage with different clothes. You know, you may not know it because uh, you haven't talked to him, but you might be a, a splitting image of your grandfather and you 
might be living out the fears and the torments of your grandmother. You just may not know it because you talk in tongues and they didn't, and you dress differently than they did, but that thing may be operating in your gut. The narrative may be in your belly, the behavior subconsciously, because that's where y'all get trapped. If it's not obvious, you don't want to acknowledge it, but everybody around you is saying, no, you got this Jezebel trait. You're controlling, you're moving a lot of this stuff, and you bind them and make them enemies because they're trying to do what God has assigned them to do to you, which is to cover your calling through the power of community. Now we're at our text. Paul, I got 10 minutes left. Watch me do it. Paul had the arduous task of managing how people relate. Why church? Because church is supposed to be a place, according to the church in Ephesus and Galatia, where I found community. The problem with America is isolated Christianity. <laughs> the way you understand your Bible is personal. Your prayer life is personal, which is why you really can't pray. You want to invite somebody to teach you. Right. It's a matter of doing it your way. And nothing about worship is supposed to be done your way. You bring your personality to the altar. It's not worth anything to God. I do it in my own way. That's idolatry if I've ever seen it. You do it his way. You don't come on to somebody how you want to be came on to. That's why your marriage is over now. You try to do what turned you on and not what turned them on. You've got to learn how to pursue. I'm preaching better than what you're saying. And I don't care. I believe it is our selfish approach to the scriptures and our selfish approach to the presence of God. Watch this. And our self-preserving approach to all things. Christianity that has made us cannibals. He writes now to distinguish those that were following the law of Moses, thinking that they could get righteousness there, and those that are following Jesus. And then he says, let me just break this down to how this works. If you want to be righteous and if you want to follow the law, number one, you got to realize that all y'all got redemption the same way. Your name is powerful. I'm about to preach now. It doesn't matter if you wasn't delivered from the crack pipe. It was the same blood. It doesn't matter if you was a whole, a prostitute, a escort, a twerker, a tweaker, a twitter. It don't matter what your issue is. You came in through the same way. Let's go to church. I don't care if you was the monster, the pedophile, the molester, the victim, the victimizer. We came in the same way. It was the same blood that delivered those that were in prison and the same blood that raised those from the grave it was the same blood that healed folk from cancer and the same folk that healed the blood that healed folk from HIV we came in the same way and the problem is in the church uh, we like to judge people by the way we think they came in but last time I talked Jesus said I am the way there is only one way I know we don't talk that way no more but look at somebody said we came in the same way we came in the same way my testimony may stink a little louder than yours but we came in the exact same same way honey you may not look like what I look like but we came in the same exact way you may have came in Baptist and I came in Methodist but I I I'm telling you we came in the same way I don't know how I got here I don't know how I got delivered but trust me we got can called in in the same way ask me how Wherefore God has highly exalted him and have given him a name that is above every name that is the name of Jesus. Every, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus, I wish I had a church here, is, they won't help me now, to the glory of God the Father. Throw your hands up and say the same way. Oh, there are not multiple entrances. Sit down. There are not multiple exits. You come in by the way of the Lamb. You live by the way of the Lamb. And so this was a different way to live. Please be seated. This was a different way to live now. Paul maintained that Christianity had to be lived out. It could not just be confessed and verbalized. You had to live out what you believe. Now we're going to go to a sensitive issue. And if you don't say amen, I'll throw this mic at you. You've got to live out what you believe. We know what you believe. Watch me. Not based upon what you say. Mm, what a pity. Because a large part of the church think that we can test what they believe by what they say. Uh, but, 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 but the church is the most theatrical place on the planet. We've been brainwashed to say stuff that we ain't believed. It. Good God. For, 
I feel a chill now. Mm. I know you want me to turn my plow. No, we just repeat things. We're parrots. We have no personal experience. We just say what we're told to say and do what we're told to do. And don't be a black person. And because we got that yes a master, yes a pastor spirit, where whatever comes from the pulpit is law. We're not going to investigate it. Come on, let's go and bust the devil open. We're not going to even take notes. We just want you to hurry up and tune up so we can go and get fat and full afterward. But then something happens when you get disturbed, interrupted. You see God, God reaches for you or your bondage exceeds the level of revelation that's coming from that might. I love your work. Your darkness is deeper from the declaration that's coming from that microphone and now you've got to live in a hunger, a thirst, a want, a desire and you don't know what to do and Paul said you can't claim soldier status without relationship to an army. You're only a soldier in your mind. But what makes the soldier is the army. What makes the soldier is the army. I'll take my time. What makes the soldier is the army. What makes the soldier is the army. The soldier does not make the army. You are recruiting. You are drafted. You are trained. You, your mind is changed. You, you are isolated from your norms. I wish I had help. You are brought amongst people with similar disciplines. But here's the deal. Even your disciplines can be deceptive if they are not born from devotion. Only trust disciplines that are born from your pursuit of God. If you just want to be a better person and just want to make more money and just want to get ahead in life, those disciplines don't have the endurance that they need to mature you I'm working in here to grow you <laughs> but when they come from devotion you got that one thing if I desire it in my heart and it'll wake you up early it'll send you to bed at night it'll make you drink your water it'll help you change your number it'll help you leave where you need to leave I want to know is there a soldier in here Oh, yeah, you weak today. I said, is there no living soldier in here where I went to worship and God gave me wisdom and I adjusted my life? You ain't no soldier because you're too punk to say yes, sir. Amen. So he deals with this. I want to know, based upon my text, which is verse 15, who's fighting with you? Because a major part, here is my message, four minutes. Thank you for your, gra your graciousness. A major part of our fundamental Christian faith, according to Galatians 5, is not just the fruit of the Spirit, it's the doctrine of community. The doctrine of community, which means it is impossible to do Christianity in isolation. Good. Say cannibal. Yeah. I know you at home on your little phone. <laughs> your funky laptop. You digital, but your deliverance ain't. Your destiny ain't. Your future ain't. Your prophecy ain't digital. In the name of Jesus, pull this idol down in Jesus' name. Sorry. The doctrine of community. Now, let's go a little deeper. I got three minutes to do it. The problem with this is that we've never conceptualized that community was a normative part of Christianity. We've never really renewed our mind to the power of community. But think about every major bondage in your life. You had support. When you are an addict of anything, you don't ever have to do it alone. You ain't got to sneak and be an alcoholic. You don't have to sneak and be a crackhead. Help me preach. You ain't got to sneak and be a freak. This is America. You ain't... <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got to sneak and be Bishop Hole no more. You can have one church in multiple locations and several babies, mamas, and all of them, and we know it. But the problem is Christianity in isolation leads to deception. Because now you privatize your understanding of the scriptures, your accountability to the word. Even biblical investigation was meant to be a joint effort. What do we see here? What does this mean? And so we have a real issue when we're dealing with this. And now that we get here, not only do I want to know, according to Galatians 5, not only do I want to know who's fighting with you, I want to know who's teaching you to fight. Because if, if you're a sergeant but you have no general, there are wars that's going to wear you out. And they're coming faster than you're ready for. Community. 
Paul is dealing with community. Scream, preach. I got some issues here. We're going to race through this. And if you don't write it, you got to miss it or recatch it or replay it or bootleg it. In community, you are conceptualized. Galatians 5 is a letter written to a Christian community. He's litigating, mediating, coordinating, and scheduling different forms of community. I'm, I'm going to explain why. Without community, we can't even conceptualize you. That's the immediate interaction. So we've got Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians trying to build scream community. And so obviously that produces a lot of conflict, right? Because you don't have my journey. I don't have yours. I was taught this. You were taught that. Your mama said this. Your mama said that. I can do this. You can eat that. I can eat that. Even down to where we got to go to eat. Because if I'm a Jewish Christian or a non-Jewish Christian, I want to go somewhere that got pig and beef and, and, and all that. You want to go somewhere else. So even those social challenges, and so we can't even conceptualize you. Mm. That means who are you in seed form? Conceptualizing you is important. Come on, open up and let me help you. There's a lot of people that left you or abandoned you and are not loyal to you because they cannot conceptualize you. That means make a healthy initial assessment of who you are, where you are, what you need, and if I can be of profit to you. That's concept. You are a concept. I understand you at concept. She seems nice. He seems cool. I could hang out with her at concept, but are you building a covenant of a concept? Do you have covenant expectation out of conceptual relationships? People that's not even committed to investigating you. Come on, let's go now. I'm talking to you about how to identify cannibals. And one of the things you'll notice is that they'll stop at seed form. They'll judge you at seed form because real relationships, especially in the adult place, scream preach, it requires more patience. We're not going on prom. <laughs> we're not going on prom. We're, 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 we're going to weather the storms of life and we're going to endure and we're going to put in the work. But when people stop at your concept, watch me, and they establish an attachment to who you are conceptually, you can't evolve. You can't grow. They are insulted by your growth. I'll preach by myself. They are offended by your changes. You start saying, I have to go to bed early, and they're mad. Scream cannibal. You tell them, I can't go on that trip because I'm trying to be more uh, frugal with my money. And they're like, oh, you're doing too much. No, 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 no. If your change offends them, they are not in covenant with you. If your maturity makes them mad, they were never with you for the right. Yeah. If all of your getting whole and healed and better pricks them, it means that they were drawn to the sick version of you. To the broken version of you. To the version of you you still didn't even like. But now that you're getting whole, if you love me, my wholeness should not offend you. It shouldn't bother you that I'm trying to be better. Do you see what I just came out of? Anyway, so conceptualize. Now, I want to come on, help me preach. I got a lot more to go. Look at somebody and say, keep that energy. Keep that energy. Come on. If you can't stay with me in seed form, keep that energy. If you want to wait till I'm famous to be my friend, keep that energy. If you want to wait to see my blue check before you check on me, keep that energy. If I'm the only one that's got to initiate the phone calls and you never just randomly say hey boo how you doing keep that same energy I'm not a dummy I know the favor of God is on its way to my life and either you're going to be a gnat or a fruit fly or you're going to be a leech or a scorpion but in this season of my life I'm asking God for eyes and ears to know who rejected abandoned aborted me at seed form oh yeah I was buried because I was in seed form I had to be deeper because I was in seed form I didn't look like what I was going to do but the oak tree was always inside of me it just didn't look like what it was going to look with and I want to praise appreciate support and bless the folk that stood with me when I did not look like what I was going to be there are people who are waiting on you to get there and go there and grow there and look like it and be like it before they get on the bandwagon but I want somebody to say hallelujah for the seed friends the seed mentors those that are with me when I don't look like what I'm going to look like I'm not there yet, but I got seed friends. I'm not there yet, but I got a seed pastor. I'm not there yet, but I got seed teaching.
I'm conceptualized. I'm conceptualized. You might be sitting next to the next everything. History might be in the person that you shouted with. Come on. I bind familiarity off this house. You have no clue what you're sitting next to. You better not get used to me, baby. Because any day now. Hey, any day now. Any day now. Any day now. Any moment now. Any reason now. Any opportunity now. God's getting ready. I said God's getting ready. Seed form, seed form. You want me when I got fruit? I thank God for those that stay while it was a seed. I'm conceptualized, then I'm contextualized because I am not the puzzle. I am not the bottom line. This is all in Galatians 5. I am not the bottom line. Depression is a form of self-worship. When it is not chemical and it's strictly in the realm of your emotions, it is a symptom of those that spend a lot of time thinking about themselves. It is an inversion of narcissism. If all you have to do is think about what's right, what's wrong, where you at, who you're keeping up with, that's, that, that, that's because you don't understand your context. You only don't make sense to those that you don't belong to. <laughs> she, I'm talking about community. You're strange because you're not the missing piece. No puzzle makes sense without the piece. But if you ever forget that you're just a piece, and you start living and behaving like you're the puzzle. What's going to happen is everybody else in your circle is going to become a pawn to what you want to see in life. Talking about community. So then those that are not in community don't understand the piece they play. The role they play. Contextualize. Number three. I'm, I'm moving through this fast because I kind of want to scream. Um, and not only in community are you contextualized, you are confronted. This is why a lot of you don't like community. Paul wrote this letter and this epistle to Galatia to confront them and to license them to confront others. You're quiet. When you get close to people, there is a realm of inevitable confrontation. Yeah. Oh, Lord, today. Thought I had a church. And 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 we love compliments. And and we love praise. Oh, we're passive people. May I also add a passive aggressive people? That's the whole concept of shade. I'll imply it because I don't have the the unmitigated gall to say it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And, and, but confrontation is necessary for your character. I feel like preaching. That people with the worst character have never been confronted. I look at people that cut up all the time like nobody really loves you. Because somebody should have told you you had lipstick on your teeth or that dress didn't look good or your pants were too tight. Come on, let's go now. When you have bad character, I know it's because you got bad company. And I don't care how many cupcakes they buy you. I'm working in here. They can go out by your balloons if they're not confronting you. Mm. Y'all hear them church mice is shouting? Because we love cheerleaders. We don't want folk to confront us. We love people to applaud us. But when folks say, hey, you violated a rule, you were flirting, your wife is over there, and we all saw it stupid. This is why so many husbands fail at husbandry. Why am I here? They try to do it by themselves. You will hear things from a man that you will never hear from your woman. And so a mature man needs to say, hey, stupid, you cannot be over there winking and wagging and flanking and hugging on women in the same church. Because one thing women going to do is talk to each other. I feel my help now. At some point, idiot, you're going to get caught. Sister so-and-so going to tell sister so-and-so. And if God is God in all nations, you're going to get caught up on the middle of the date. I'm here to tell you the prophetic in this church don't just happen at the altar. Folk walk up on you while you walk. Exactly. 
contextual, confronted, confronted, confronted. In community, I am confronted. We're almost there. In community, I am confronted. When I see greatness on anybody, I immediately assign them to a team. Because I want to make sure that they can interact with other people. If you prefer to work alone, something's wrong with you. Yeah, you got an issue. Somewhere in there, something's there. But confrontation is a powerful part of the development of character. Can you be confronted? Or are you so defensive that your community has decided that you're not worth And do you really want people in your life that won't confront you? Right? Yeah, let's keep going. I'm almost at my, my point. Then you're confirmed. You're confirmed. You're confirmed. You will learn more about yourself in community than you ever cared in isolation. This is all in context of this epistle. And not just your weaknesses. Scream Yes. There will be strengths that you learn about yourself that because you're so used to it, you don't see it as a gift or anything supernatural. But those that have not lived your life and been in your journey say, hey, that's not a normal thing. That's not something that every human finds it easy to do. Many of you are in gift negligence because you're in life isolation. Real community can help you see what you've mastered that you hadn't even realized. Oh, yeah, you've loved something that you don't realize you've loved, and you've loved it so deep that you can teach it with your eyes closed. You have a passion, something you can talk about that uh, you could talk about every day for the same amount of time and never run out of content. If you can run out of content, it ain't your purpose. But when there's a deep well, a cistern in you that you just, you just keep reaching for it and revelation comes and understanding comes, you need to be confirmed. That's your problem. You, you're, you're probably a vagabond because you're looking for confirmation slash affirmation. Somebody, watch me, that just gives you the permission to be you. Just be it. Just do it. Whatever it is, God will handle the bondage. He'll handle the pain. He'll handle the blood. He'll handle all of that. Just be. And there's a lot of people. It's called the bastard curse that's roaming around in life just trying to look for permission to to exist. I just want to be me without anybody wanting to fix me or change me or mutate me. I want to be a heal me. I want to be a righteous me. I want to be a delivered me. I want to be a restored me. I want to be a beautified me. I want to be the me God called me to be. I don't want to be the me that you can live with. And I can't really be me. You're challenged. I'm almost at my mystery. Endure this. Then you're challenged. You know, Elder Jasmine, you'd be surprised at how many people don't like being challenged. I'm delving into the mystery of community and why discerning yours is important. Because if you don't really have real community, ain't nobody really challenging you. And here's the deal. You will always have people criticize you. But to criticize and critique is not to challenge. To criticize and critique, critique is to magnify the weakness. To challenge is to reach for the strength, pull it to maturity so that it outranges the weakness. You will have a weakness for the rest of your life, but who's challenging where you're strong? You don't go to the gym for rehearsal. You're supposed to be challenging yourself. That means you put weight on you that's heavier. You do more reps than what you're used to. You make yourself uncomfortable. You, you sweat and you keep going and you scream. And if you, if you don't believe demons is real, you ain't been to the gym. Ain't, ain't, <laughs> ain't no greater demonic sounds like folk trying to lift weights. I'm telling you what I know. I mean, folk, uh, I'm like, all right now, all right, you, you get, lose him. To turn him loose. If you don't believe devils is real, you ain't had a real workout. <clears throat> Right now, you got to let him go. But you've got to challenge yourself. We serve a generation that loves the anointing and hates reading. Love singing, can't stand studying. They want to praise. They don't want to fast. They want a microphone. They don't want to wake up early in the morning and seek God before they scroll on their phone. 
priorities is all whacked up. They use marijuana to create because they think 420 got the power to pull out their potential and their creativity. Meanwhile, they only talk in tongues on Sunday morning. And he is the creator of creativity. Ain't no high like the most high. The devil is a lie. Community. Community. Challenge me. Let me know. I could have done that better. Go deeper or nah. Two more and then I'm moving. We are also convicted by community. One of the things you'll know, that this is all in Paul's epistle, that you have the right community is your convictions deepen. If they decrease, you've got the wrong people around you. The right community is supposed to help you increase in your convictions. And here's why. Here's why. They are sent to defend your future. So part of what that means is even if you feel it, even if you're right, even if you're justified, even if I understand it, I will not silently allow you to do it because I'm in defense of who you're supposed to be. Now, you're quiet because you don't understand that conviction is a tool in the hand of the Holy Ghost. Conviction is the steering wheel that he moves when you could do what you want to do and he won't allow you. I, I got a couple more points, job, but I want somebody to shout because of what he didn't allow you to do. Just Y'all lie. Y'all are lying and full of crap. I want to hear somebody in the room that's like, Lord, I promise you if I could have gotten away with it, and if there wouldn't have been no proof, I would have done it immediately. I needed to medicate myself. Is there anybody here to thank God for what he convicted me of? He gave me gas. A chest pain, a bad ache, something got me out of there. Flee it, flee it. Yes, it Verse 13, one minute. Paul says, convicted. I'm crazy, but I've got convictions. Crazy is everywhere, but conviction is rare. And if you still got your conviction, if you fell last night and felt bad about it this morning, don't buy that. That ain't the devil, baby. That's God helping you hate the thing. Hey. To put a bad taste in your mouth so that you never go back. I wish I had somebody that's too convicted to return back to my old self, back to my old ways. Here's my message. You're convicted, and this is important. Listen to me, because if you cannot listen, if you cannot be convicted, you cannot be converted. Come here. Yes, sir. Peter, the, the enemy has sought to have you, that he would sift you as wheat. But I pray for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, and when you're converted, he says this to an apostle. He says this to an apostle, when you're converted, um, do you realize that you're still changing? Anointed and changing, can sing and changing, can preach and changing, can dance and changing. Here is the mystery of this. I did all of that scenically to get here. Paul said something that scared me. Based upon what you believe, what you ascribe to, what you've been through, what your mama taught you, what your jurisdiction engrafted in you, it's become a source of tension. And now you're biting and devouring each other. My intent was to get here to talk about cannibalism. What does it mean when a person has gotten bit? And what does it mean to live devoured? Like Brittany, when David says stuff like, when the wicked, not if, hmm. came upon me, they wanted to, They wanted to eat my flesh. The sin of the tongue 
in the context of community yeah. is why a lot of you will not serve right now. You are a victim of Christian cannibalism. How do Christians eat one another? It's simple. Words. 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 You lent them money and they disclosed your business. Words. You prophesied to them and they talked about your pain. Words. It's interesting how we can build whole congregations with a pallet for personal pain. John, you know what's stupid? There are people who have made whole careers off of broadcasting people's personal grown men and women who created careers off of talking about what's wrong with you and what hurts you and what you're not doing. And they call it news. It's entertaining because y'all have a palate for it. Now, Paul warns, all of this was important to me because of this one perspective. I wonder what he meant, Chuck, when he said, be careful. If you keep using all of this as your justification for why you can bite and devour one another. He said, be careful that you don't consume one another. In the Living Bible, in the ESV, he says, be careful that you don't eat them away. I wonder how many people refuse to return to the Christian faith because they're bleeding from a bite. They were bitten before they got brought into community. Who and what is on your menu? Who will you be talking about tonight? Come on, open up. Who will you be attempting to do so? As I run speedily through this, I'm six minutes over my time. I want to talk to all of the cannibals in the room. It's quiet, I know. You don't like that, do you? The, the cannibals in the realm. But under Galatians 5, there's a list of the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. One of them is witchcraft, reviling, emulations. I did a word study on the, the word emulation, and it means to use somebody's success as your scrutiny. Uh, are you grinding because somebody else is growing? <laughs> I know. Biting and devouring. Because it, it, although it should be inspiring you, what it's doing is it's making you seethingly jealous. Then he names murdering and he names witchcraft. Now, I know y'all think that witchcraft is about bees and brooms and hexes. But what witchcraft is, is the usurping of one's will. <sighs> Help me, Lord. It's not always dust and glitter and gold. It's you projecting your will, thoughts, desires, opinions, verbiage, definitions on somebody else. You putting your plan and your will on them using prayer or prophecy or preaching or love or sex. Because sex is a powerful form of witchcraft, especially when it's good. Put those hands together and you. Why y'all uncomfortable? Rebecca, they won't say, man, good sex will have you in mind control. You'll be at work and can't get it out. You should have said amen because now I'm going to crack open. You'll be at work and can't get the images out your head. You'll be experimenting new positions and new things to try. You'll be pre-scheduling how you're going to get away with it. I'm looking at you. You'll be on your little dumb apps trying to see who's available in a 20-mile radius. It's because all of that is a work of witchcraft. What it's going to do is put your soul in a pretzel and you won't be able to decide until you get delivered. There's grace for that, too. But then you come in the house, you're like, yeah, it was a rough night, doc. I need healing. You come to the altar only to meet Hannibal. I'm going to pray until you feel shamed. I'm going to lay hands on you and beat you up like you are the devil you host. I'm going to preach at your pain because it gets me more amens. Mm -hmm. because people who don't know who they are love to see others suffer it, it's an odd fetish it's, it, it, it gives me great comfort to see that you just as broken as me and, and just as wounded as me but Paul said if you keep on biting 
You keep on devouring. Be careful that you don't eat each other up. Matthew, I wonder if every empty seat in this room represents a bite somewhere. I wonder if there's somebody at home watching me live stream that's like, I would go, but I got. Now, here is why this is important. If you try community, and everybody should, you're going to run into the appetites of the people in you. Relationship is about appetite. Write that down. We're connected because of what we're hungry for. Right. So if our appetites are in conflict, if our drives are in conflict, we won't last very long. We don't want the same things. And if I'm not mature enough to handle your difference, I will dismiss myself. That's how it works in relationship, right? But if you run into somebody's appetite, last week I preached to you about staying hungry with the things of the spirit. But some of you have a vampire appetite. This should be fun. Miriam Webster defines a vampire as a seductive person. Anyone who seduces. Pastors can be vampires. Friends can be vampires. It is very interesting. The story of Hannibal Lecter always intrigues me. And you look at this and you see this in Galatians 5 when Paul is like, be careful, stop biting and devouring one another. What I love is that all crazy don't look the same. You can master looking normal all you want, Dr. Lecter. You can have a great career, but that's survival. At some point, the truth about where your soul is is going to be figured out. If somebody attempts to love you, they're going to run into that appetite. It's going to happen. As it may take a month or a year, but we're going to run into what don't work in your heart. We're going to run into the fact that you don't have no more cheeks to turn. We're going to run into all of that. We're going to run into that. What I love is that he was intelligent, smart, scholarly, talented, accomplished, but he still had an appetite for the blood of other humans. Is that you? Do you prophesy and then gossip about what you prophesied about? Are you an intercessor that talks too much? Oh, come on, open up. Is it... How do you trust an indiscriminate intercessor? Ma'am, God can't trust you with his files. Why should I entrust you with mine? An intercessor has to learn discretionary rights. I can know it and not say it. I can know it and not agree with it. And you can be it. And I can stand in vehement defiance to it because I know that's the devil's plan and not God's. If I'm an intercessor, I'm not in agreement with what hell wants for you. I'm in agreement with what the agenda of heaven is for your life. So I'm not going to make as a matter of conversation what the devil's got planned for your life. And then bro you. You got witchcraft, seditions, emulations, strife. Another one was reveling. So I'll close here. One of the issues of cannibalism was reveling. There were segments in this Galatian church where people were encouraging people to defy authority. Yeah. Reveling. It was literally like, hey, she your age, bah. Or he been here longer, uh, as reasons to disrespect authority. So whenever you see that in operation, you know somebody is moving in a cannibalistic nature. A, an appetite for blood. I get excited when you fall. Your weakness is, is, is current events because I don't understand the sacred nature of community. What's the first thing Jesus did? Created a community. Because he knows you're not going to live out your faith, your purpose, your calling unless I put you in a group. You need life support, a life cohort, a real one. And preferably people that don't mandate you be an old you. Preferably people that see where you're going and where you're headed. Does this make sense to you? I want to know who's looking out for your best interests or who's developed a taste for what's wrong with you. Cannibals. Now, your experience may not be mine. Mine is definitely not yours, but I know hundreds of people that have been the victims of Christian cannibalism. People who use their faith, their experience, their testimony to qualify, strip, rip, dehumanize people. If you're a Christian who can't love on non-Christians, you're not a Christian. 
If you get uncomfortable when you got to hug a Muslim, you have not the Holy Ghost. I don't care how many tongues you got. You sense somebody's got a sexual issue or perversion and it makes you uncomfortable. That's your issue. You don't want to hug people because of a transfer of spirits. Doofball. You're biblically illiterate. It happened one time in the scriptures and that to pigs, not person to person. The devil is a legalist. So I wonder, Pastor Richie, how many people ain't healed because they ain't had a holy hook. This is my point. We're going into a season, prophet, of detoxing people from their bite bleeding out because they've been bit yeah it's right there in the scriptures I didn't make it up if you keep biting each other you won't have one another and if you won't have one another because here's the real truth can we be real some of us are tired of being bit and I know they preach and, and life coach you into thinking that everybody's replaceable that ain't always true you will meet once in a lifetime assignments and relationships that's supposed to do things that other people are not anointed to do. Steward it by not being cannibalistic. If I'm in your corner, I'll cover you and correct you. I'm not going to correct, then uncover. Yeah, understand. And there's many of you who think, may I stay in my office? That all nations worship assembly is a spa. You've come to 11 like you had a sauna. Like you just bowed to rest and reprieve from 20 years of church labor and exhaustion. Not so. You will not waste the oil, the sacrifice, the tears, and at least two of these seats is one of your assignments. And that's on the bare minimum. I know you don't like it, but I don't care. This ain't a place to relax. The waters are trouble. And they're troubled in Times Square. <laughs> when the angel of the Lord comes and troubles the water, you jump in and you get as whole as you need to be to sit among the wine bibbers, the drunkards, Witches can be saved. Sex addicts can be delivered. You will get smacked for being a part of this mercy revolution. They're going to say you're unclean and dirty and stupid and lost your way. They're going to say all kind of stuff. Holiness is still right. Get right, get left. And most of them can't even write. Forgive me. Make it make sense. But when you have a mercy revolution, nobody qualifies, and that is our unity. <laughs> I don't look at you for a reason to judge you or curse you, and I don't get home. I don't get excited by saying God loves me more than you or that my calling is more necessary than yours because I'm further in my devotion. This is important. You're like, make it connect easily. Those that are most vulnerable to Christian cannibals are outside of community. You need community. And community should focus you, not distract you. It should heal you, not ensnare you. If you find more bound by community, you don't have community. You should be freed up. Not necessarily without conflict or disagreement. But I feel more free. How do I know when I'm free? I can be honest. I don't care what people think. I have nothing to prove. And I can be held accountable to my wrong. Why, why will you allow yourself to be intoxicated by a culture that praises your right and forces you to suppress your wrong? Herein lies why so many people are in church right now. And they're going to leave just as bound as what they came because they can't be honest and still be loved. Not here. Not here. This will be a grace place. 
and the power of God will be present to heal all that need it. Witchcraft. Lasciviousness. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the... Y'all can laugh. Girl, you're so serious. Lasciviousness is a word, and I did a uh, word study this morning, Pastor Darren, on the etymology of the word lasciviousness. And what it means is body medicine. Now, when you translate it in, in, in the Bible word, it strictly translates as lust. I wanted people who can't stop indiscriminate random sexual behavior understand that they're trying to medicate something. Don't get, don't tighten up. There's no such thing as casual sex. It involves your soul. Whew. So lasciviousness is the expression of a life in pain. And the body, write this down if you can, the body will express the decisions of the heart. So once the heart has made a decision that it's alone, it will use people. Once the heart has made a decision that nobody really can care or be there, that everybody's not to be trusted, it will go into the pleasure or the erotic realm of love, but it will avoid the agape at all costs. Eros love is non-sacrificial love. It's physical pleasure. It's like what you feel with brownies. It's called oxytocin. It's a chemical that you have when you breastfeed or have sex. It permanently attaches you to something. So a lot of what you think is God sharing with you about a spouse is chemical reaction. It's the same reason why many of us don't know the, the difference between the adrenaline and the anointing. You being excited don't mean God is here. And you being bored don't mean he's not. Praise God's name. I'm believing God to send hundreds of people here that have been bit by bad doctrine, by unethical practices by fear of God by mistake or you know people can disqualify you so much that you start repeating it to yourself that you start believing it you're not worth it you're not worthy you're not going to be here God won't fill his word around you stupid you ugh, that ain't worth it that becomes a place and a point of meditation and then you direct your devotion towards the devil here's the challenge your devotion will determine all of your days. If you think about the way your days go, root it immediately to your devotional life. My day starts devoted. And, and I will always be indecisive if my devotion is not intact. Now, I know that's simple, but if I could get half of y'all to just pray daily, half your wars wouldn't be what they were. Just start there. I ain't even gotten to fasting and Bible study and seminary, I'm just like, at least pray and give Monday to God, Tuesday to God. Lord, I'm believing you for every relationship you want me to have. Lord, I'm believing you to open my eyes for every liar, deceiver, anything in my circle. Those are things you need to pray. As I go to work today, you be my peace. Don't allow me to be tormented and or harassed by coworkers or colleagues. Be my peace. Yeah. When you go to church, focus me. Let your presence be sweeter than honey. And, and don't let me be distracted by a mean usher or, or a bad note on a song. Those are the things you need to pray over your days. Lord, you know what you're doing to me. Make me sensitive. One of the things that I know about people that have been bit, particularly in the community aspect, is they develop two versions of themselves one that people can live with and one that is honest when you go home at night that's the real you you in front of us that's the social you people don't publicize pain normally they're ashamed of it but what if we could create a place in Times Square where pain was popular it was a common language we wear it differently come on open up don't be scared of that and I know the church has taught people to put that under there. But I love when people are like, yo, I'm hurt. Because that's where the blood rushes. That's how miracles happen. I want an honest culture. I do. I want people to be like, I was up all night on drugs. And I'm like, to God be the glory. Y'all would kick them out. Because you're cannibals. 
and I to eat people that are broken. But Jesus knows what it feels like to be eaten. <laughs> this is my flesh. This is my blood. He did that so we could know what to do. Life is flowing because of how you handle who ate you, who bit you. It's okay. All right, I'm going to pray. We're going to open the doors of the church. Before I pray, though, I want to sober you. You might not be the victim in this. You absolutely might be Dr. Lecter. A functional cannibal. Who just socially who likes to parade people's brokenness or capitalize on it. I know, because Desmond, here's the real truth. We don't want to talk about this, but I'm going to say it because I just feel like I need to. Predatory behavior is very real. You slide in my DM one more time, I'm going to know what you own. Can we open up? How many times are you going to bro me and we've never talked? What is your motive? Predatory behavior is very real. And don't be naive. God knows in order to change your heart, he's got to assign you to community. But the devil knows the power of letting something lurk in your circle that you don't see immediately. Consecrate that circle. Y'all are uh, real quiet and uncomfortable. I'm telling you the word of the Lord. Consecrate that circle. Examine it. Look around. Question. See what's there. And some of you may need to throw them hands up and say repent. Because you might have been the cannibal. You might have looked at your sister and just said, hey, wait, can I have some ketchup? I'm going to discuss her and her marriage, him and his money. I'm going to weaponize what he confided in me because we're no longer close. And I'm going to find myself partner with whoever don't like you. It's Christian cannibalism. Am I talking out the side of my neck or have you seen it? It's all over social media. Praise the Lord God. The nation can't fight. They just know how to type. Because if everybody typing got slapped, folks would stop typing. You can't repost this with a broke jaw, dog. But that heart is expressing a monstrous appetite for the pain of people. Why do you mock people that are broken? drunk person comes in here now who staggers to the altar for deliverance who does this he he ha 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 somebody dressed in the clothing of another gender comes in here does your arrogant self point it and say I plead the blood I plead the blood I plead the blood I plead the blood they don't want you or your man both of you are spam cans but are you so judgmental that you've decreed off the brokenness and the assignment of hell on somebody else against yours? You think your Jezebelic mama and your perverse brother are going to different hells? Your mama's controlling. She'll end up frying with the people you judge. This is why the balancing ground and the equalizer of it all is the cross. That's why you're not going to catch me bashing and hitting and you know one of the most insensitive things is there was a season where a lot of pastors were killing themselves and scream cannibal and one of the most insensitive thing a Christian can do when somebody experiences suicide is make it a matter of how spiritual or not the person was it's so awful well if you just want to plead the blood you come poop Somebody's family has to read your criticism of a person who probably really didn't believe in God and had a bad moment. And most of your kids came here because you had bad moments. Somebody responds to a bad moment by ending their life and you want to make it a matter of your preaching. If that's Christianity, I don't want it. That's what it means to be like Jesus. I'm going to Buddha big tail. I can't handle it. I want a Jesus that heals, a 
Jesus that restores. You're going to catch a woman in the act and then kick me out of the church because my stuff is obvious. I need the same blood as you. That's the type of culture I want here. Why do y'all get so happy about knowing people's sin? Y'all are sick. You get excited. Mm-mm. Sir, ma'am, this is a grace place. That means if it can't get healed here, it can't get healed at all. My Savior saves all manner of disease. I want to pray for those of you that have been the cannibal, those of you that have been victimized by it, <laughs> impacted by it, so much so that you disrespect your own gift because somebody used the sin of the tongue to bite you. I know what it is to be the subject of, of green room conversation. It's not always easy to walk in spaces, watch me, where you have an assignment and you know you were verbally attacked. And do you choose the assignment? Do you revel over the attack? Or do you resolve that the attack comes with the assignment? You can't have one and reject the other. The good news is he is a shield. He will preserve you from the cannibals. Dr. Lecter going to come for you and try to eat your flesh, bite you, weaken you, tear you down. Yes, Lord. Make you rehearse and meditate memories in your mind about who you are and what you are, what you're not reminding you constantly of what you've not achieved yet and you're bleeding out well, you need some healing so it starts with honesty this happened to me then here's the fun part guys you get to start counting the apologies you owe instead of the ones you think you're due that's grown for Christianity I know you don't want to hear that but the more whole you are you have no problem with admitting you I was just trying to love forgive was doing. Is that wave at me if that's okay? Y'all look very uncomfortable with that. I know that's not churchy, but I'm trying to prevent you from becoming a vampire. Eating people. So-and-so, so-and-so got a divorce. And you like repose mm, the body. Bro, sis, what's in your closet? Mood and bad, so ends over. There's some secrets in there. Mood and old dusty draws over, sir. You got several possibilities in there. Hey, Nana, you weren't always this clean. Come on. That's why staying to the cross is so important. Because you'll look at somebody in pain and not use your progress as pride. I can pray for you because I used to be you. And I can labor with you and be tired because I wanted somebody to be tired for me. Where would your children be if somebody got tired for them? You got a baby that's on crystal meth. They come to the altar and somebody's like, I'm not getting up until this kid is free. Isn't that the goodness of God? Would you rather that or somebody tell them, you're not ready yet, baby, go back fast? I'm putting y'all on detox, yo. Crazy is everywhere. Compassion is not. I can find more crazy than the nation has lost it. I can't find a lot of compassion because it's not something, unfortunately, that's a church motto. Rules, yeah. Dogma, yeah. Compassion. If I said right now, maybe in this context, but in another context, if I said right now, you are in full-fledged adultery, you are the other woman. You're, you're in a relationship um, with a happily married man, and you envy him and his job and his wife and all of that, and you've aimed him. 
And if I said, stand up so you can receive ministry, I guarantee you, no one would have the bravery to do it. And I understand it. Because church people will shame you. I smoke, but I ain't that. I drink, but I ain't that. I love me some good old porn, and let me just help you here so that you're quiet. That's not a young people issue. I'm looking in the eyes of several of you that had a good time over the last couple of days. But it's by grace through faith. Your process don't have to be mine. Mine don't have to be yours. If you critique my outfit, I have to talk about your hair. Talk about my child, I have to talk about your husband. I've said hi to him three times, he's not responded. So yes, my kid is bad, but your husband's slow. But think the point I'm making is that it's unfair. There is no even line. There is no justice. That man says, huh, one more time. That's why it's just, be- I'm serious. It's just best to find yourself at the cross. I don't do it that way, but I'm at the cross. I'm, you will never find another man of God in this city as a sermon topic of this pulpit. I know they do it because they ain't got nothing else to say. I am never making another ministry, another man of God, another view, the sermon topic of my pulpit. I'm not going to experiment with you. There's healing and deliverance that won't. I'm not going to use this to say what I disagree with from them. It's stupid. It's the act of preaching cannibals. I'll take 40 minutes and preach against what I don't believe. And meanwhile, we don't know what you do. And I came here broken and confused and hungry. And all you wanted to do is bash your opponents. That's cute. So let's give this a real try. I don't want to be a cannibal. And Lord, if you entrust me with anybody broken, First of all, help me with my brokenness. I neglected to say this. The key to this, we were taught that it was idolatry. And that was one of the works of the flesh. The problem with your love capacity is that you can only love people in the way you love you. And in the church world, we've been taught out of self-love as if all self-love is dangerous. Self-love is only dangerous when it does not include the cross. Self-love is important. If you have to love your neighbor, this is in our text, as yourself. He said the whole law. Because if you worship it on the Sabbath and you still don't love your neighbor, you violated the entire law. Remember, if you broke one, you broke them all. And he said it's summed up with this, love your neighbor as yourself. (laughs) It's that heavy on the love yourself part. And it's sad that we're in churches that teach us to hate ourselves because of where we're not and so that creates watch me an insufficient funds when you try to learn how to love anybody else because you're like me and me trying to get this together I was trained to hate me groomed to despise what about me was different I was preached into it forced into it so now you're trying to pull me into this love journey which is a healing journey and I don't know how to do it for me and if you can't do it for you stop dating God be praised Because if you can't love yourself and you start experimenting in grocery shopping with other people, they're going to become your pain experiments. And you're going to keep going until you learn what works. If you can't forgive your father, don't ask God for a husband. Shut your mouth. Don't do it again. If you're a man who's barely learning your own personal responsibilities, your bill's late, don't ensign nobody else up to your lack of responsibility. Have the integrity to be ready or as ready as you can be. The way you do it is step one, you got to love yourself. Hey, there's a lot that I don't like, a lot that I need to grow in, but I love me. This version, hey, glory, I love me. Changing and growing. Now, it's quiet because there's a lot of cannibals in here. Y'all look at it. Y'all like, oh, girl, he's so, 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 so. But what if people are acting out because of pain? And what happens the moment when you realize their pain is similar to yours? The only difference was your outfit. 
what if you found out you were cannibalized by the same way? We've got to be a compassionate people. And you learn that in community, somebody over the last seven days should have corrected you. Hey, that was too much. You said too much. You did too much. Somebody over the last seven days should have confirmed you. Hey, you're doing good. Be encouraged. Be strong. Or pray randomly. Do y'all have prayer partners anymore? Is that old school? I feel so bad for people who don't have intercessors. Let your birthday party be lit with that little dumb cupcake. The waiter's coming out singing this god-awful song to you. And you got all these people you ain't talked to all year sitting at this table celebrating a story they abandoned. What if you were the kind of a man or woman that could reach over at two in the morning and just call somebody and say, just pray. I'm about to do something stupid. Just pray. I don't feel myself. Just cry with me for a minute, please. We can't just join and, and be connected over bondage. I, I want to I wanna know if I can trust you with my war and my walk. Stand up. Let me pray for your community. I'm going to pray an uncomfortable thing over you, but it, it's necessary. For where you're going next in your life, you need to know what's around you, even if it hurts. I'm going to ask God, even if it hurts your feelings, show you. It's too much stuff to be done. You've got too many regrets in your life. Uh, you need the right community. And when they come, as they form, you need to make sure there ain't no cannibals around you. What's a clue? They find that y'all mainly join over what they don't like about other people. That's not a commitment to you. That's common subject matter interest. Every time we talk, I got to know about up to date. What, you know, we have people in our lives that would get offended if they didn't have recent drama. How could you not tell me that? So and so, so and so had an abortion. And, and they made an issue of relational loyalty and not understanding the power of human discretion. And you don't know because it's not your business. And that's not me being secretive, it's me being a confidant. The enemy will use whatever you can't confide in another human as a basis of your torment. This is why the Bible says confess your faults, not sins. I don't know you to tell you all my sin list. <laughs> David said against thee and the only. Clap your hands, it's private. But I can, I can give you my faults and my flaws because I'm not committed to being perfect in your eyes. I don't want to perform. And if I have to perform, I'll dismiss myself from you. My real community is supposed to make sure they protect me from Hannibal and the cannibal. When you get verbally assaulted or attacked by your enemy or an enemy and it wins you, like it takes the breath out of you, my immediate correction, hear me, is not going to be for your adversary. I'm going to rebuke your corner. Here's why. Why are, why are they louder than y'all? You see, if your adversaries have more to say about you than your supporters, your advocates, Advocacy can break the authority of your adversary. The problem is y'all get attacked by enemies and friends go quiet. Just pray. One of the greatest lies I've ever heard in church is I'm praying for you. That's probably number two to I love you. Say lie. God's about to send a lot of crazy stuff in here. I've seen it with my eyes. I've dreamt it. I've had visions. It's about to be some crazy stuff in here. It's going to be everything from church hats to tattooed tear ducts on their eyes to blue hair to piercings. And some of them will look unclean to you. And then you're going to have to be arrested like Peter was and a white sheet fell. Kill and eat. Don't ever call unclean. 
because God never called who? Anyone to be unclean. If they are unclean, it's not because he called them to be that way. He wants to clean everybody and their lives and their appetites and their motives, but it will not happen without community. You think about Muslims, the bloods, the crips, the army. You're recruited into a manner of life and you're provided support to live it out. In many churches, we don't have the opportunity to live out what we've been taught. Community is how we do it. I'm tested by what I learned, by what I'm being groomed in, by my community. That means that if you don't want to be accountable, bring me. I'm me. The mountains melt like wax. <laughs> God's about to do some things and, and construct your community. And he's going to do so to heal you from the power of Dr. Lecter. I'm sorting through stories that I'm hearing in the spirit right now, and I don't know who's is who, but I'll call it out as I feel led. But you can't use the pain of that experience to justify your disobedience to this next assignment. And we're in a, a season, it's fresh, of, of brand new assignments, scream yes. But if you're still bleeding out, what's gonna happen is you're gonna lag in your obedience to the assignment, okay? Now in the assignment is your sanity. Now I'm gonna say this, and I'm not saying this to be professionally disrespectful. There's a lot of people losing their mind, not for chemical reasons, there's a lot of people losing their mind because they're not in their purpose. And when anything is not in the trajectory of purpose, mental anguish is inevitable. You're going to go crazy as long as you're committed to not being what you are. That's the only other destiny you have. When somebody says no to their nature, they go crazy. They lose it. And some people get stuck there, Bree. They live there for decades. Woulda, coulda, shoulda, and and now, watch this. I feel the healing. The, the, the regret turns into a relational cancer. There's a lot of people that are relationally tumultuous and hazardous because they have so many regrets. And when they show up and try to be your friend or be your sister, you become the recipient of 20 plus years of regret. And so you can't win. Because when you win, watch me, what does it trigger? My regret. Yeah, we were just friends and sisters and brothers, but you won in an area that I feel like I lost. Now, so rather than celebrate you, I'm going to eat you. You're on the menu. And I'm going to go to your little dinner and celebrate you. Order my steak medium well. But then I'm going to text people that don't want what's good for you and say, I'm on my way. I'm getting out of this stupid party. You were just singing. Just I'm going to be honest. You just told me happy birthday. You understand what I'm saying? Cannibals. Awful. Kiss you on the cheek and turn around and be like, ooh, that heifer. And you know what's funny? The time variant, Asia. It don't even be whole 60 seconds sometimes. I've witnessed folk on the altar. Be healed. Be healed. Be restored. Oh, she stank. Got it. So on that altar, in that moment, by whose authority, in whose name, and under whose agenda were you just ministering? Yes. Now, if you will allow, I will be petty. There, church is comedy. You will find never-ending material for laughter in church. I fight weekly to not laugh at many of you. The anointing comes and I get serious. But church is funny. Black funerals are funny. I think musicals are hilarious. I mean, I've seen some amazing things. But I want to know how much of it means anything to God. If we can't hug somebody that smells like their life. If I can't take off my red bottoms to labor with you, if it may mean your deliverance, 
or if I'm worried about creasing these boots that I couldn't afford to begin with, but I bought them to keep up with stuff. I'm talking about compassion. Compassion will bring stuff out of you that you didn't even know you have. When you're filled with the spirit of compassion, man, you think you was praying for 20 minutes, you'd be on your face for hours over problems that aren't even yours. It's compassion, zeal for the house of the Lord that consumes. I'm concerned about the generation that's been eaten up that's not here. Vexed about it, honestly. But it's produced a godly frustration. I'm trusting it's going to turn into a pattern on how to do it. Because it can be done. We can't keep biting each other. If you're getting divorced, I don't need the details. Many of you would be a better friend if you weren't so nosy. Yeah, you need to know, but why? Come on, can I just minister to you on this? It's about your community. You could be literally going through hell, abated in your strength, and the wrong community will make you feel weaker the right community, even if they say something crazy to you, they're going to pull for your strength. Hey, this is what happened, but this is your potential, and I will hold you accountable to this, or get rid of me. I will never, I will be there for you in weakness, but I'm never going to come into agreement with you abasing yourself to a weaker version of who you, you've been through too much to do that, to go back to that, to retort to that. It's too much got cannibals around you bro part of what they want to do is see you disobey God cannibals many of them are nice they smile well many of them you got history with but you have no clue about whether or not you can trust them cannibals man just out cannibals those that value your gift and hate your story those that pray for you and ask for your number afterwards cannibals cannibals that share your last name cannibals in three different states family cannibals that you had to run from. You went off the grid for about a year. What are you talking? You're tired of the bleeding. Lord, this is your son. If nobody, oh yeah, you need to receive that. If nobody else claims you ever, you're the Lord's son. There is no paternity war in heaven over you. You're the Lord's son. Even if you want what they wanted, you're his. Come on, receive. You've been trying to tough it out. You've been toughing it out. See, in a storefront church, and you were the subject matter of a conspiracy. The pastor and two elders discussed you. Tried to set you up. Threatened you on Facebook. But the Lord said, going to restore you. Come on, help me pray. He will restore you completely. You're his. 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 Come on, lift your hands. God's here. I said God's here. God's here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up every person under the sound of my voice and this next chapter in their lives. I give you glory for the steps, the cadence, the rhythm that you call them to. Let me be your intercessor, will you? I lift up their decisions. I lift up their emotional makeup. I lift up their psychosocial emotional selves, their psychological selves to you. And as their hands are lifted, I'm praying right now that you would make them and form them in the image and in the statue 
stature of the Son of God. I lift them up where they've been, where they are, and what they desire. Every angle of their testimony, their story, and their journey belongs to you, and we give you the glory. We thank you this morning for every birthday. We thank you for every conception day. That there is rhythm and reason for every life in this room. We bless your holy name. That there is not a life in this room that is not without reason, and uh, there is not a reason to be justified for them to live other than you've selected them. Hallelujah. You foreordained them from before the foundations of the world, and we give you the praise. We bless you, O oh God, for how you've been grooming them and walking with them. Every woman, every man, under the sound of my voice, you've been holding their hands since childhood. Come on, receive. You guided them through preschool, and you guided them through kindergarten. You walked with them through first through eighth grade, and for those that went to high school, you walk with them then come on open your belly you walk with those that had to get a ged life and hurt and pain huh? took them down and over and overwhelmed them but you were the god that walked with them and you are our journeying god my god you love walking with us you walk with us in the cool of the day <laughs> you walk with us in the middle of transition you walk with us as the seasons change thank you oh god for never leaving us we give your name the praise of this morning uh, as the word was delivered in this place as the word was delivered to this people I ask so oh God that you would unlock the corridors of the hearts of every person under the sound of my voice break the padlocks off of the hearts of every person under the sound of my voice and I'm asking oh God that you would stir deep plans deep plans deep plans deep plans within the heart those that feel purposeless those that feel like there's no way to go those that feel like they're walking in circles and cycles will you send something refreshing to the chest cavity of everyone under the sound of my voice where you're not just stirring gifts and callings my god but you're stirring capacity ah you're stirring potential you're stirring abilities that be born by the spirit oh yes you are i give you glory now that you saved them for a reason you delivered them for a reason you sanctified them for a reason you sustained them for a reason you've upheld them for the reason and let this be the days that they see the reason that you kept them alive in the strong name of jesus oh god i make intercession right now for those that have been the victim of a religious bite for who they are for what they feared for where they were going for what they were taught for what they believed for what they struggled with for what they wore through for what they journeyed through those that are bleeding out my god because they are afraid to draw nigh to a god that they don't know if he loves him or not to a god that they feel like is indifferent oh yeah to a god that they don't think and don't believe that he could ever have his single focus on them we turn our eyes right now to the lover, the lover, the lover of our soul. My God, we turn our eyes now to the lover of our souls. You know everything about us. Come on, move your stomach. You know our uprisings. You know our downfall. And when the sun comes up, you know us. When the moon comes up, you know us. When the devil claims our lives, you know us. Now we want to know you. In the name of Jesus, now Satan, we bind and we break the authority of every word curse spoken and implied over every destiny, every life represented under the sound of my voice. Word curses from mother, word curses from father, word curses from sister, word curses from brothers, word curses from colleagues, word curses from the dead. Self word curses, curses that I put on myself while looking in the mirror. We find and break the authority of the curse. Come on, fire. We find and break it now. Your word declares that the power, come on, I feel it moving. The power of life and death is in the tongue. We find the illegal power operating in the tongue against my purpose, come on, against my gift, against my ability, against my future. I will not be distracted. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, pull us out, pull us out, pull us out of wrong community, pull us out of distracted community, pull us out of community that's a 
produces pull us out a community that drowns that drains that kills pull us out show us the counterfeit show us the counterfeit and bring real community correct us through it change us through it challenge us through it convict us through it conform us conform us to it hey oh yeah oh yeah Oh yeah, send it now. Send it now. Come on, we find cannibalism. All blood thirsty, blood hungry agendas operating in the hearts of this people. In the name of Jesus, every agenda of jealousy, every agenda of envy, every agenda of comparison, every agenda of strife, every agenda of the orphan curse, every agenda, come on, every agenda, every motive moving in the heart. In Jesus' name. Realize that the bleeding stop. Let the bleeding stop. Let the bleeding stop. Those that have been strangled by strife. Those that have been choked out by gossip. Comparison. Come on. Let the bleeding stop now. Condemnation is a repetitive conversation from the forces that have been after your soul that are in partnership with hell and it consistently repeats and replays what's wrong with you. But you're only coming to righteousness when you choose to by faith believe what's right with you. Jesus did not die for what was wrong with you. He died because something was right with you. Lift your hands now and exalt. Exalt a perfect God. I want you to exalt him because what he did through Jesus for you had nothing to do with you and everything to do with his goodness. Come on, exalt him now. There's a cloud starting to settle here. That part of what's going to happen is you're going to come from under years of condemnation. Years of condemnation. There, there, there is therefore now. No, no, con no. Yeah, no. Friday didn't happen. No, no. Friday did not happen, no, there is therefore now no condemnation, come on, now I know this is unusual, but I want you to get desperate for a minute real quick, strip the band-aid off of it and get hit, there is no condemnation, I will not see myself through the lens of my failure, through the lens of my weakness, through the lens of my need, I will not see myself through the lens of what's wrong. I will view myself through the glorious power of the gospel. 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 I will be integral to the gospel. I will renew my mind to the gospel. I am not my own. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. Woo! Hey! Woo! Oh yeah! Stop the bleeding. Stop the bleeding. 
accidental ones those that have been excited about what seems like is your deterioration you will recover and as you do you will be insulated by a holy community I have a prophetic word the Lord the Lord wants this church to crack into the mystery of adventure I know that sounds weird, but it's a part of how many of you are going to fight through and for your deliverance. When you feel like your life is absent of joy, you return to things that comfort you. You need to find some adventure, a trip somewhere, a beach somewhere, climb a mountain, ride a horse. And I know you think that this is natural, carnal advice. But what I'm teaching you is the way to sustain your longevity and your gift. It's got to be adventure. Now, you can sit in that house all you want to looking out of the window and wait for church again next Sunday. You're going to die a miserable whatever you are. I'm going to pray for passports in a couple of weeks. Because the Lord is opening something else up in me concerning the power of international influence beyond the internet the international currency, the international conversations, the international rooms, international diplomacy, international projects. God's opening up the nations again. It's going to be something really weird. This church is founded on the concept of Psalms 2 and 8, ask of me and I'll give you nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the world for your inheritance. God's about to do something with your life that's bigger than your roommate or your block. That's why you got to get ready. Lift your hands one more time. Jesus, never again allow us to use what they did to us to keep us in disobedience to you. Help us, oh God, to never again abandon our call because we are afraid of the criticisms of the crowd. Deliver us from Christian cannibals. Help us to forgive where we were bitten. assaulted. Help us. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to really wrestle with that. If you can, keep your hands lifted. I don't want to pray through that real fast. I don't, I don't desire that people be repaid or that family members give me a refund for what they weren't there to celebrate or support. Although I'm the most achieved of them, you made me feel like my graduation and accomplishments were minor. One of them told me that was the least I could do. I was not celebrated. Only to live for the applause. People that will never see me for my own uniqueness. And then sisters, sister figures, consistently leaving us after I help them. Come on, lift your hands and sit in that, y'all. Why do you feel big? Maybe it's them. Maybe it's you. But you've got to stop bleeding. You must stop bleeding. Costumed yourself. 
put yourself in places of invisibility because of, of the extreme scrutiny you come from. It sounds like you did more wrong than right. And the wisdom your ear was hungry for, you never got. But then you got platformed. Now, you won't reprieve, but not so. There is a labor for you. It's a deep one. It's a powerful one. Eat well now, because the days are coming. And they're coming very, very soon. Jezebel could only threaten you for one day. It won't last the whole season. You will not bleed out. You will not bleed out. Glory to God's name. Repeat after me. I release and forgive every word curse, judgment, edict, conclusion, opinion, delivered about me, publicized about me, broadcast about me. I release and forgive the statement and the offender, the witnesses, the observers. I forgive them and I receive now by faith my openness to new community, to righteous community, to holy community to be accountable, to be held up, and to walk through life in the power of the New Testament. Thank you in advance for sending my people in Jesus' name. I'm going to put those hands together for the Lord all over this building.